we've got a discussion today about uh, the future of momentum. And on the show, we've got one person from one group of a slate standing for the Momentum Executive Committee from Forward Momentum. And we've got one person from the other slate, Momentum Renewal. And we've not had a discussion as far as I know with the two um, people, different slates before. Um, to start the discussion, I wanted to actually bring in someone who's not been um, too chuffed about momentum and has actually left momentum quite re well, fairly, fairly recently. And I'd like to hear her view on why she left momentum so we can get a context for what she thinks is wrong with momentum. And then we can ask the two people who uh, I've invited to speak what they think um, can be done about that. So Libby, are you there? I am Crispin. I just need to correct you because although, yeah, I've, I am disheartened, um, I'm fairly disheartened with the Labour Party too. I haven't left, but I do have some strong criticisms, and um, there are things that I think both slates need to listen to and also take on board if they are to truly um, move momentum in a direction where it can be of help to the left. In the Labour Party rather than a hindrance, which is what I think it became. Right, so um, what, what, what issues do you think um, Momentum needs to address uh, to improve uh, from you know, what it was, what it has been? Um, well, I was, I was um, in Momentum from the very beginning. In fact, I was one of the people who set up Brighton and Hope Momentum, um, which came out of the Jeremy Corbyn Jeremy Corbyn for leadership campaign and um, and I met with all the um, people who were in London and they I can remember meeting with, the, with them on a demonstration literally a couple of weeks after um, Jeremy had become leader and we were talking about the role of momentum and I just said well for me there's one aim and that is to put Jeremy in number 10 that was the aim of momentum and they agreed with me and um, that you know the, that that was the goal, and what we have to do is admit we failed, and look at why we failed. And I don't think anyone's really looking at what went wrong in momentum, other than to sort of blame individuals and things like that. The problem is, um, you know, momentum was successful for the first two years. In 2017, momentum was brilliant in its support for marginals. And we almost got there, and the Labour Party almost got there with Jeremy Corbyn. Um, but between 2017 and 2019, it failed. It was unsuccessful. And I think basically the crux of it was momentum stopped being about supporting Jeremy Corbyn and started to try and have its own political agenda. Um, basically, most people in momentum um, didn't support upholding the the um, vote in Brexit and that was a real you know and that went against Jeremy Corbyn and he was mm. forced um, not just by the right but by the left in the party um, into an impossible impossible situation really momentum should have been put in the agenda of socialists which is to support jobs support education health housing and the environment but too many people were focusing on this whole remain going on all these, you know, and it was all remain, remain, and really wasn't really connecting with, you know, we, our last show, we showed, we were talking about why we lost the red wall. Who was listening to people there, you know, in momentum? And also we need to look at um, something which I haven't heard anyone talk about, which is the leadership of momentum. And I'm not talking about John Landsman, I'm talking about, um, the national organizer who basically is a Keir Starmer supporter you know why <laughs> has no one thought about that at all um so I think that question needs to be addressed too um and what I what I think with these two slates I mean I'm really interested to hear what they would do for working class people because working class members because I attended the primary and my question didn't get asked. And my question was about working class representation in momentum, um, because you have women's representation, you have BAME representation, you have quotas for these, and that's 
that's fine, that's good. You don't have any quotas for working class. And I just think the domination by middle class people makes it, it you, you know, you, if you're going to have a party and a movement called Momentum that's supposed to be for working class values, you need to have working class people representing themselves. You can't have middle class people telling working class people how to do it. You've got to have working class people doing it for themselves. So I'd like to um, find out how many people on each slate are from manual labour jobs. Um, and I'd also like to suggest to anyone in Momentum, which I still am, that rather than vote for one slate or another, because if you vote for one slate, the other slate, and you get a whole slate in, the other lot is just going to bugger off. And so in order to unite the left, I think we need a combination of both. Because otherwise, it's just going to be one faction taken over, and that's not going to be helpful to the left at all. I think what we need is to be coming together. So when I vote, I'll be looking to vote for people who represent the values that I'm talking about from both slates, and I'll also be looking at individuals who are standing as independents for the NCG. Have you just winged it that I've just been out? I've been crashed for about, I don't know, 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't know. I just kept talking, Crispin. <laughs> Did you really? I, I can't believe it. Um, so <laughs> have, have, we got, um, have we got Mick there? Mick? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. yeah. So what, what's, what's your response to Libby that I haven't heard, but I'm interested to hear? Well, where do I start, Libby? I mean... Uh... There's like 100 questions that you've uh, put there, but uh, I think there's 100 questions that most people in Momentum are asking themselves. I mean, what, you're, what you've just said there in a nutshell, I mean, I think Momentum's been, the, it's the only organisation I've been in where most of the members of it, when you ask them about the organisation, they're just not happy with it. I, everyone's miserable with the way that, 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 that it's put together. Um, I agree with most of what you're saying. So... I, I just want to jump forward to the kind of the bits that I that might not agree with what you're saying, although I think I probably do uh, um, ag agree with you. I mean, this thing about what momentum was in the beginning, obviously it's about, it was about supporting Corbyn, yeah? Corbyn's not the leader now, so momentum can't be about that. So, you know, what, what is it about? Um, I think we need to recognise, you know, Corbyn played a brilliant role, but it wasn't about him as an individual. It's about the hope that he uh, he he he, he, rep he represented, and it's those ideas of hope that momentum needs to get back to. Of why all those ordinary people got involved in it in the in, in in the first place. Now I hear what you're saying about working class politics. All my life, that's what uh, I've been about. I've got to admit, I've got a bit of a chip on my shoulder about I don't like the posh boys telling us what to do. Not that I'm saying the other side of this thing is that I just I, be. be upfront about that but it's about working class people organizing for themselves that's the kind of politics that that i'm interested in now one of the things that because i've been talking about this for about two weeks now the coronavirus thing everyone's saying look we're going to come out of this and everything's going to be different there's a really big opportunity for the left to organize now one part of me i really agree with that but i think coronavirus and the the, the outcome of it is it, it's going to be sharper, but it's just the same old, same old. It's the fight that we've always had on 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 our hands. Now, who who are we about? What is momentum trying to represent? And I think it needs to represent. I mean, people call us dreamers or whatever, but it's those people that are involved. So, Libby, I'm glad to hear that you're in still in momentum at the moment because on the 11th of June, the last chance you're going to have to have a say about what happens in the future with it. But it's those dreamers that we've got at the moment, good or bad, whatever they are, they're good people. But the real people I'm interested in is where is momentum support? Where is Labour's real support? I would argue that it's outside of momentum. It's outside of the, the Labour Party. There's a massive, in their millions, audience of people that we've got to address. 
And I think momentum is the tool that we can we can uh, use to get that. I'll finish on this thing, Crispin, because I've, I've got verbal diarrhea. I don't mind admitting it. One of the things I've been banging on about at the moment is Jeff Bezos, you know, the head of uh, Amazon, yeah? A man who's as rich as he is, dull and uninteresting. He earns just shy of $9 million an hour, $8.9 million. That's three, over 300 times more than an Amazon worker earns in a year. Now, it's not just Jeff. There's an entire class of people that run the world like this. And I want to turn that world upside down. And that's not going to get turned upside down with what we have now in momentum, what we have now inside the Labour Party. It's about bringing an entire new generation of people being into politics. And that is the key thing I think that momentum gives us. It gives us a vehicle, an opportunity to start addressing that. Anyway, I'm going on too long, Libby. Hope I've answered some that's of your right. things. But, um, that's all right, mate. I'm going to mute you in a minute anyway. But um, yeah. uh, I'm only joking. Uh, uh, Joe. Thanks, Crispin, and um, thank you very much, Libby, um, for, for, for what you said. Um, it, I, found I, just, it really I just say, Joe, Joe is from Momentum Renewal, and because uh, I, I got I crashed out strangely, and Mick is, is from Forward Momentum, just so everyone knows. Uh, sorry, yeah, I'm, uh, thanks, Crispin. Yeah, I'm from Momentum Re Renewal, uh, and uh, Mick's standing as a candidate for Forward Momentum, and I'm not standing as a candidate. Um, I'm chair of my CLP in Hull North and I'm on the uh, Yorkshire and Humber Regional Board. Um, and I think um, a lot of the things you said, Libby, really resonate with uh, my experience and I think the experience of a lot of people. Uh, talking about the general election, talking about, um, you know, how uh, we moved away uh, as a party with a position on Brexit that put, um, that, that forced Corbyn into accepting the second referendum. That was always going to be a disaster and you know living in Hull in a city where we've got we had a 67 percent leave vote uh, we had a huge number of people um, who are lifelong Labour voters who voted leave um, many of whom we managed to get up back on board in 2017 but we couldn't in 2019 um, and Momentum Hull which is the organisation that I'm involved with uh, we we, we put out a statement when we were seeing these press briefings um, that, as you mentioned, the, uh, the unelected director of Momentum seemed to be pushing this second referendum position. Um, and there were members of the NCG, elected members of the NCG, who pushed back on that um, because Momentum members, I felt, wanted to get behind Corbyn, whatever they felt uh, on Brexit personally, and they see the danger coming. And what Momentum Renewal is looking to do is recognising uh, that we lost these seats in the red wall that we came very very close to losing a hell of a lot more seats uh hull east for instance which is john prescott's old seat which was one of the safest seats in the entire country and also one that had the, the highest uh, one of the highest leave votes Carl Turner came within a few hundred of losing that and had it not been for the brexit party we would have lost we would have lost ian lavery's seat we would have lost john trickett's seat but it's no coincidence that ian lavery and john trickett and candidates like Chris Peace, who's been on this show uh, a little while ago, who, who was a PPC in North East Derbyshire, are backing us, backing Momentum Renewal. Because what we're trying to do um, is to hear from those heartland communities. And I think we're going to talk a lot about representation and democracy within Momentum. And that's absolutely right. There's, there's, there's been a, you know, a, a deficit in terms of, of, there's been a gap between members and the organisation. But there's the real gap for all of us, for the Labour Party, is not within our organisation. It's 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 whether we're representative of uh, working class communities, and at the moment we're not. That's always been an issue. It was an issue under Blair, um, and we've got a massively expanded membership. But my branch, um, I live in, as I say, Hull North CLP. We've got five hundred members. There's a small part of my branch, about five streets, that got about three hundred of those members. And then on our, uh, this is this is the party rather than momentum. Um, and then on some of the big council estates, the membership is a hell of a lot lower. Um, and that had been going for, for, for many years. And we have to get back in touch. We need to momentum to be um, engaged properly with the trade union movement. Uh, and we need to make sure that our candidates, however we select them, are representative. As you say, you mentioned about working class candidates. I wouldn't draw um, working class candidates as being just manual labour. Um, I get what you're saying, but I think... Uh, the working class is certainly broader and if you were yeah. to look into quotas it'd be quite difficult to define but I agree with the, the spirit of what you're 
you're suggesting, because what we're going to do um, with momentum renewal, we're not having primaries, but we are asking for people to apply. We've got a board that has a remit to get a regionally, geographically age representative, that we have uh, representatives of, uh, of people from all different backgrounds on our slate. Um, and I think um, we'll achieve that better through momentum renewal um, than through a primary system. Um, I'll stop there. And if you uh, obviously want to come back on, on things we've said, we'll, um, we'll do. But thanks very much for, 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 for what you've said. It's very thought provoking. Um, can I can I sort of because because I like what happened was my daughter just put some crumpets in the toaster and it fused the whole house. So I came up <sighs> for uh, 10 minutes. But um, I've got over that. Uh, I hope, uh, but I'd like to ask some questions about the democracy side of it, because there's one thing that I was sent in a few questions. Um, a few people asked me to ask you two questions. One was quite interesting, which is that John Landsman has stood down um, from momentum, but he wants to be part of the NEC. Um, so how would he be on the slate for the NEC unless he's voted for? Would there be an would John Landsman automatically be on the slate for the NEC or would he have to stand for a vote? Would, would, you, do you, would you have a comment on that, Joe? Or? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I, we, we would have a process. What we didn't have last time, the absolute disaster of the, the, the by-elections where we were split all over the place amongst the broader left, within momentum and amongst the broader left, and it had disastrous consequences. We need left unity uh, in terms of a slate. So Momentum would play a role in that, CLPD would play a role with that, other organisations would play a role with that. Momentum would have to have its own process, but there's no uh, question that somebody, anyone automatically gets onto that. John's been on the NEC. I think he's done a very good job on the NEC. I think he's done a hell of a lot of good for the party. And I know a lot of people have um, criticisms of him. I have my own criticisms of him, but I think he's done a hell of a lot of, of work for the, for the party. And if he wants to put himself forward as a candidate, Momentum would have to have a process to, um, to, to who they're going to give their support to. And that's got to be in consultation with other groups on the left. Momentum is not the only group on the right. left. I, but, but the, yeah, so John Landsman would be open. There'd be a, a new uh, vote for who would be on the NEC and it would include him. Uh, He'd be if, open for, for not being on the NEC, is what I mean. If John wants to put himself forward, then that's got you like anyone else, it could be considered on. Uh, right. Got, and, and Mick, Mick, what's your view on the uh, NEC selection? Because that was a, a, a bit of a, uh, uh, how can you put it? Is it balls up? I think that's the term. Um, with the last one, where two people were comp two positions were competed for by loads and loads of people so what what's what's your view on how to resolve that okay all right listen i'm listening to what joe says and i agree with an awful lot of what joe is saying but this is one of the key differences i mean i'm involved in forward momentum i don't like to call it a faction or anything like that uh they threw their hat in the ring over this idea of uh, open primaries which i'll explain why i think that's an important thing. But I just want to come back to this thing about John. John's a lovely chap, apart from his uh, taste in shirts. You know, I've had him around the house. I haven't, I, I'm, you know, there's no point bemoaning uh, a, a man. You know, we can't fight yesterday's battles the whole time. But this idea that just because you've sold the most raffle tickets that you get to win the prize, that doesn't carry water with me. The people that decide who our candidates should be, should be us. It shouldn't be a small group of people consulting with other people, because if we are genuine, if we really honestly want to build a massive movement based amongst young people, amongst the BME community, amongst trade unionists, we need to be democratic right from, uh, from, from the beginning. Who should select the left slate? Not me, not you. All of us should have a say in that. What are we? Are we just going to be handed down from on high the wisdom and told what we have to do. Now, there are certain times where I've done that, where we've all done it. The whole thing about Corbyn, we were in a war the whole time. We were fighting to maintain a position, which if the truth be told, Jeremy got elected without any, a, any machine or a, a left organization behind him. And we paid a price for that. We paid a price really working hard the whole time to get out and defend him from those attacks. Now, regrettably, Jeremy's no longer the leader. 
I, I, I don't want um, Boris to last for five years, but we've got a period of time now where we haven't got that gun against our head in terms of that we have to support a certain leadership. So I would argue we've got, uh, we've got some time to think about it. I think all members, all left members, should have a say in who the left candidates are. It's wrong for things just to be decided by well, insiders, where it's just I'm who you know that gets... I'm I'm aware of the time. Can I, can I just sort of um, talk about the similar issue was about the deputy leadership and the leadership selection uh, for the last uh, election that we just had with Keir Starmer and whatever. Um, there wasn't much of a choice being given to Momentum uh, members on that. Um, would both of you support every, every candidate for leader and deputy leader being open to membership to nominate? Yes, um, I, I think um, what they did in the time frame uh, was, you know, um, it, it, it was um, not ideal. And I think we've recognised that in the statements we've said. I think, you know, momentum members have to be fully consulted on th important decisions like leader and deputy leader. Um, but so I would I would support that totally in the future. And, and that's that's what's um, on our list of um, uh, uh, policies or demands. So okay. I, I'd go further on that. I think the the thing about the last uh, NEC, you know, they're having a split split thing in it, that palpably lost us uh, lost us that vote. But also, how the leadership and deputy leadership thing, right? We ran the show. The left were in the ascendancy. Why didn't we have a plan for what comes next? It was a shambles the way that all played out. And why is that? Because the people that are in the leadership of it aren't accountable to the ordinary members. Um, and and, and we, 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 pay, we pay a price for that. That's something that we've got a chance to fix now. I would have every position open. Everyone should be able to put their hat in the ring. Uh, sometimes that might be messy democracy, but it will stop us doing that thing where we have to just back an idea that we've had no say in of, of who these people are. Right. Um, the, 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 I mean, I've got to move on to another issue here. Um, the data is something that people were talking to me about a lot in questions. Um, who is controls the data? I mean, the thing is, Momentum's got a massive database of, of people. Um, is, is the position that John Landsman owns that data? D does anyone know that? Or is, can it be... As far as I'm aware, Chris... People? Chris been um, as chair of Momentum, John, John is a director. I could be wrong on this. Um, he's stepping down from the position of um, director. Uh, sorry, of, of, of chair. So we will no longer be in that position. So he doesn't own the data uh, so himself. Whoever, whoever, whoever comes through in this election, they'll they'll have access to all the... Um, well, the, the, the chair of Momentum would formally have that. But I think, you know, as far as I'm not up on charity law, you know, sort of constitutional arrangements, but that effectively um because they have to have a named a named person right I, i've got tuppence worth on that then yeah i i think this thing about data i mean it's something that we need to really pick up momentum for the kind of sharp data-driven operation that momentum have done that's a new thing in politics that team of people that are in charge of that that's a brilliant kind of uh, campaigning technology that, that we've developed my problem with the data isn't the idea that someone will run off with it Data is just, it's just an outcome of a living struggle that we're in. If, uh, we, if the band gets back on the road again, the data will come back in again. The thing for me about the data, and it's incredibly rich, the momentum data, is ordinary members in local groups should have access to it. What's the point of having this massive database unless you can leverage and use that locally? So I'm up for the democratization of, uh, of data and then it gets, gets given to local groups to have access to it. Well, that, that's, that's something I remember. I set up a, a momentum in, in Hounslow and I couldn't send uh, messages to people in Hounslow without going through the central uh, office. So it was a bit, um, bit time consuming in doing all that. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, wrap up this, this um, discussion uh, because we've got lots on the show but um, I think this has been quite constructive I think both of both of you have similar ideas um, and I think it's quite good that 
but that you'll open for looking at um, how we can engage more people and open up the democracy and, and make it more refreshing, refresh it. I mean, it was a Jeremy Corbyn vehicle, but Jeremy Corbyn is no longer leader and we have to keep building or otherwise there's nowhere else to go. Can I ask just one thing, Crispin, without making a, a, a party kind of sided point, which is you've got to the 11th to vote in these elections. Lots of Momentum members think their membership might have lacked. I'm in it to win it. We're in it, all of us, to make a difference with this thing. So I would urge you, if you do nothing else today, apart from look at his bloody shiny hat that he's got on, make sure that you're, you're signed up with Momentum to vote in the elections, because it should belong to all of us. Absolutely. Thank agree. you, Mick. And, and Joe, do you want to, because you know, it's only fair that you get to, to say something about my hat as well. Well, thanks for thanks for uh, having me on, Crispin. I've, re I've really enjoyed it, and thank you very much to to, to Libby for the uh, the points and the questions that she posed. I hope it's it's given people a bit of, more of a flavour of what the um, the two slates are about. And as Libby mentioned, people can stand as independent candidates as well. Uh, and I would just echo what Mick says, but you know, um, if if you're on the Labour left uh, and you want to make a difference and you want to uh, support some or all of what we've said and you want to get involved please do join momentum uh, it's it's been a very successful organization overall uh, in terms of historically on the labor left and it can uh, can do good things in the future if we all work together thank you joe um now libby what, what's your uh, you can do this quite short you can do short comments here can't you libby oh i don't know about that crispin <laughs> go on <laughs> um well i i would just urge all momentum but members to vote because it's our right and i would urge all both momentum uh, members not to vote for one total slate because if the whole of one slate gets in half of the, all the others will leave and i want to keep everyone in so that we have the biggest um movement possible so i should be voting for half and half and if there's independence i'll be doing a third a third and a third on the independence more or less, but I will be looking at the individuals. I'm definitely going to be voting for Phil Clark from Brighton because he's a, he's an absolutely brilliant candidate. But Libby, but, this isn't a way you can uh, flag what? your your um, favourite characters here. Oh, am I not allowed to say that? Sorry, Crispin. I didn't realise it was um, no really. <laughs> Good try. Good try. <laughs> but I do have I do have control of the mute button, Go even on, though you, I you could possibly me. be. <laughs> Frazzled by, by another um, fuse by from just, Crumpet. Just basically. one question though: Who will be the momentum spokesperson for these people? Because at the moment it's an unelected, um, you know, um, organizer or whoever it is. You know, they've never been elected. The people who are the actual speak spokespersons. So that's the problem, surely. And none of the slates have even addressed that problem. Well, you've got you're going to have to do another. We have to do another show on that one. Just that one question. <laughs> um, Thank you, uh, Libby. Um, now, P Pamela Fitzpatrick is our regular, um, I suppose you could say, columnist, uh, who does a special um, feature every 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 show um, called Labour Leaks Update, and uh, we think that Labour Leaks are worth highlighting every single show because. Uh, some people don't seem to think they're worth talking about, but I think they're quite disgusting what's happened there. Um, now, Pamela, are you there? I'm here. Yes. Hi, Chris. Um, can I just say that, that um, we know that you stood for the General Secretary and you got to the interview and we read uh, on a tweet that I believe you didn't, you didn't receive news yourself. You just got a tweet you read from yeah. someone else saying you hadn't got on the shortlist. Is that a bad sign about how the Labour Party's going about things? It's a really bad sign. So the reason I hadn't really ever thought about applying to be the General Secretary of the Labour Party, I think it's a horrendous job. But after uh, Jenny Formby stood down, I had lots of people contacting me. And the driving force behind it was Labour leaks, that people are so horrified at the culture that is in the Labour Party they want it to change and they want somebody who will be principled and will actually tackle it. And I'm actually really genuinely you know, honoured that people thought I would be the person to do that. So having looked at the job description, I finally kind of thought, well, OK, I do meet it. I'll have a go. I didn't really expect to get even 
interview, to be honest, because I'm not sure I'm kind of going to fit in with uh, the current leadership. However, um, I was long listed, I suppose, and had my first interview on Thursday. However, even before uh, the long list appeared, there was a list um, on Twitter of the people who'd applied for the position, and nine of us were leaked by a Murdoch journalist that we had applied for the position. Now, I'd been quite open about applying, but other people may not have wanted their current employer to know that. So it's a clear data breach. So who's leaking that? So that's Labour leaks too. Uh, the whole process was quite strange. This is the top job in the Labour Party. And I do a lot of recruitment myself in my own organisation. And it basically had about a week initially to apply and the shortlisting and the decision. It was slightly extended and there were rumours that it was slightly extended because all the favoured candidates kept getting knocked off the list because of leaks and uh, problems about their credibility. Um, but it was still a really quick process. There was no detail included in the initial ad about time of interview or the process or anything. But um, I was long listed and I was told that I'd be given an hour before the uh, interview a um, topic on which I had to do a presentation. So I had my interview with, I think, 13 people of the NEC, uh, three of which were staff, on a Zoom in my kitchen like I am now. And the interview was fine. It was fine. Um, I didn't know whether I'd get shortlisted. However, by the end of the day, literally the minute the interviews were over, because I know somebody who was having their interview at the end of the day, I saw on Twitter that same Murdoch press were reporting who had been shortlisted. So it's a really bad sign. And what's a problem is it has to be one of those 13 people. So what investigation is going to go on to Labour Leaks 2 and 3, no matter Labour Leaks 1, which is very serious. So I hadn't been informed by the Labour Party, simply heard through Twitter, which is really quite appalling. But I then got an email later that night, I suppose people were concerned by then, from HR saying, no, you're not being put forward further. Um, if you want feedback on your interview, then, you know, give us a call. So what I've done instead is to say, thank you very much, very much. But actually, I think you need feedback from me about the whole process. So I have given them feedback about the process and how bad it is, but also asked them questions. So anybody who works in kind of data will know how sensitive you have to be around breaches of data. So what have they done? Because there was a data breach about a week ago with the people who'd applied. Have they investigated? Is this something that falls under GDPR? I don't know, but if it has, have they reported it to the Information Commissioner? Um, and then the subsequent leak, has that been reported? So I haven't had a response yet, but these are quite serious things. And who of those 13 people has access, regular access to the Murdoch press and why? Why are they doing this? Now, I have to say, I was told that 17 people had applied, but I think only nine were revealed to the press. So why those nine? And it started me thinking that is one of the people who weren't leaked the possible front runner? So um, yeah, we have to wait and see, but it doesn't bode well. It doesn't bode well for unity, it doesn't bode well for integrity. And it just goes back to the same old kind of culture that we looked at in that dreadful report. In terms of the report itself, of course, still nobody has been suspended for quite horrendous accusations in that report. And also we have GMB leaks, which we mustn't forget about that also. And also, I don't believe that anybody mentioned in GMB leaks has been suspended from the party. So we really have this two tier system where if you're ordinary members, <laughs> we're at risk of being suspended for quite minor things, perhaps. Um, and yet some people seem to have some protection. And some of those people mentioned in the original Labour leaks who feature very prominently are on Twitter. Um, seemingly without a care in the world. Now, if I'd been accused of such terrible things, I'd be doing all I could to assure people that I wasn't guilty of such a thing. I certainly wouldn't be behaving in the way that some of them are. 
so it doesn't oh, bode well. One of those, those those comments from one of the people. I'm not. We can't name anyone, but yeah. I'm just saying it did. It did make me rather my blood boil actually to yeah. see that. But, um, Absolutely. So what I have to say is, um, I think it's quite <laughs> quite. Um, in many ways good that I haven't taken that job as the general secretary because we know how Jenny Formby was treated and you know it's not a good place to be um, and it has to change and we the members have to make sure it changes the Labour Party ought to be a beacon for all institutions but particularly as an employer and this just isn't good enough it isn't and I want answers and I'll keep asking and keep making a nuisance of myself very politely all the time. But we have to keep on at this. And I really pay tribute to Crispin for keeping this in the public eye, because I think the party, some in the party, are thinking that if we just stop talking about it, then it will go away and nothing will happen to those people. And it's not acceptable. I don't want to be in a party that thinks it's OK for bullying, for abuse, for racism, for ableism and that it's okay to try to undermine the party in getting a Labour government because it doesn't suit their individual power battles. So that's it for now, nothing more, but we'll keep on at it. Okay, oh, thank you very much, Pamela. Um, and we're going to, uh, we've got, I've got some great news um, coming up uh, towards the end of the show. If you stick around, I'll, I'll let you know about that. Um, and everyone, um, if you if you stick around, there's some really good news um, coming up uh, at the end of the show. So what I want to do now, though, is move on to some of our um, comedians who have often been left to wait for quite a while before they get on, um, which is not really fair, especially as they're so fantastic and they've given so much to the party. And I mean, for example, Don Biswas, who I'm who I've just unmuted, did, has done plenty of shows for Labour um, all over the country and raised money for the local parties. But he can't get live work, can you, Don? No, I'm um, struggling to get live work at the moment, but I'm really grateful for the shows. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Hello, Don. Okay. Well, you okay. They're all muted, thank God. Thank God they're all muted. Uh, thanks for putting me on early. Last time I closed this show and it was so long I opened the next show. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I, I want to start tonight. Oh, by the way, can I just say I want to make a confession to Pamela there, Fitzpatrick, is that I myself uh, have got access to the Murdoch Press. My parents were the news agents. Hashtag lazy joke there, but I'll move on to the jokes I actually planned. I'm going to start tonight's show by telling two jokes. Uh, both jokes are exactly the same, but if the government can double count the test, then surely by that logic, I can double count my jokes. <laughs> so uh, moving on to my next thing, I'm going to start by telling two jokes. Both jokes are exactly the same, but if the government can double count the tests, then... <laughs> Uh, we've also heard about Dominic Cummins, he's broken the rules. Did you know that both Professor Neil Ferguson and Dominic Cummins have visited more places during the lockdown than Judith Chalmers did on Wish You Were Here? <laughs> and that's a joke for your older people, they're older than 35. <laughs> Everyone knows about Judith Chalmers. Uh, lockdown's been hard for me because I'm on the free mobile phone network. So my daily work, my daily walk involves me looking for a signal. <laughs> and I think one thing we forget in the discussion because it's important to talk about momentum in the Labour leaks, we have to talk about this horrific immigration bill that Preeti Patel has passed through and once racists find out that she's a Hindu and they learn about reincarnation they're going to be horrified they're just going to say all oh, these Hindus coming over here staying in this country more than one lifetime <laughs> <laughs> I've been Don Business, thanks very much. Enjoy my show. Don. And uh, Patrick. Hello there. Are you Crispin? Are you doing? I'm good. Oh, there you are. Right. Uh, you've got a light bulb, two light bulbs behind you. You be, be careful with those, Patrick. Be careful. Crispin, I've had to move rooms because look, uh, my, you know Lily, my partner, my missus, look, look what she's yeah. doing. Can you see that? She's oh, going around the house, trying uh, to get the house up. Look, we've not even finished. That's the same. So what was it, white before, or was it was it green and she's just done the top corner, the top of it? 
Why? I, Crispin, I don't know what you're on about. I don't know what colours are, mate. It's all the same. Yeah. I think it's just warm colour. I think that is probably a white. Probably a white. And no, what did she do no, with your lampshades? What's she done with the lampshades? The way she's put them, uh, she's been just going crazy because it's a bank holder weekend. So she's just trying to do the place up. She's just going madness. Do you know that it's a bank holder? Uh, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's like, I love it. Every week we're all about it. Everyone goes, what day is it now? No. Day. Can I just tell you, it is a bank holder. And I only know it's a bank holder weekend because when my partner, she told me that as she went out the house to try and get more paint. And I thought, great. We have got only four days next week of work, which is fantastic of watching TV instead of five days because I'm sick of it. I don't... I don't <laughs> Five more days in a row of watching telly, Crispin. I've got to have a Monday off doing something totally different. And do you know what else has changed as well? That as that nobody, nobody now, nobody, nobody asks how the weather is anymore. Nobody, and we're having great weather. Nobody asks that anymore. Do you know what, <laughs> do you know what they say? They go, "How's your broadband? How's the Wi-Fi spells? How's your how's your Wi-Fi signal? Is it good?" People go, "Hey, uh, um, have you been to the garden? Have you been out to your garden?" No, I can't, mate, because my router doesn't go that far, mate. Nobody's interested. I don't know where I am now. I don't know what day it is. I don't know what the weather's like because people just ask me about inside the house. The other thing I have, um, I've had to look at this because we've been talking about what's been happening about work and, and stuff like this. And I, and I don't know if you heard it, but you know, the government have been saying about what's happening with, uh, with jobs and stuff. But they were saying that if you can work, do you remember last week they were saying if you can go to work, right, and you can travel there safely, then go to work. If you can stay at home and work, then stay at home and work. Right? But if you can't, then just go to work and try and do it safely. But then I was just thinking, but then what about the people who don't want to go to work or, and don't want to stay at home and work? What about us people? I just want to go to Blackpool and pretend I'm working. I don't want, I don't want any of these other options. <laughs> I'm, I'm sick of staying at home. I've stayed at home for the last seven weeks, mate. And then it, it, it's just bonkers. That is. But then there is a, there's this new thing which has been happening. I don't know if you heard about this, about where they're saying that a lot of the businesses, they're slowly reopening and the services, but it's going to be a new system. It's called the new click and collect system, which is, I've already seen it happen. It's probably happened all across the UK where like our local cafes is great, local restaurants where you can't go indoors anymore. But what they're doing is a click and collect service. You've got to, you order your coffee, or you turn up, you get your drink and go. And it's fantastic because obviously we know with the McDonald's have done that, the drive throughs but also this is turning to other services as well, like for weddings. I don't know if you've got any friends who are doing weddings, but they were restricting it before to five. And it's going to be one of these where you can only turn up, you say congratulations, you get a slice of cake, and then you clear off. Right? It's absolutely fantastic. You're not messing around, stay in there. Same with funerals, you turn up, you say, I'm really sorry, grab a sandwich, get yourself home. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they're doing the same. They're doing the same for christenings. They're doing the same for birthdays. And it'd be brilliant because... Do you remember what it was like before? If you had two mates getting married on the same weekend, you couldn't go to both of them. Now I can go to 17 weddings, 32 for <laughs> I'm going to Christmas. I don't even know who the people are. I'm just turning up. Well, there'll be food there. I'll just say hello to the kids and go like this. And then this is the other thing. All the other things are slowly opening up. Like for instance, the gyms, they're saying that obviously with the gyms, it's a click and collect service. You can turn up to the local gymnasium once a month, you give them 30 pounds, they set fire to your money and then you leave. <laughs> <laughs> Every month, just give them a couple of quid and then you vanish. Then the other thing is Primark as well. They're hoping to open up a clicking uh, where you turn up once a week, you grab one item, throw it across the shop and then leave. And then you've got the other ones is like Harrods where you turn up, you go, how much? I can get it from Wilco for a tenth cheaper, mate, and then leave. And then my favourite <laughs> is the hairdressers because you can go to the hairdressers, but you're not allowed to be within two metres of the hairdresser. So you just stand there for 20 minutes. They ask you about what holidays you had to cancel this year and where you haven't been. And then they show you a mirror about how bad your hair is and then you leave. So it's all fantastic. It's really, this is going to be the new normal that they're saying. And the last thing is weather spoons. The way you can turn up to weather spoons, order a pint, get shouted at, and leave. So these are these are the things that. I'm <laughs> 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 this, is, this is the craziest thing that I have I've heard people banging on about nonstop over the last couple of weeks, and, and even friends. In fact, people are going, they're going, yeah, but you know, you know that we're never going to go back to the old normal, and you know that it's not going to be a normal normal. You know that it's going to be a new normal. I'm like, what are you on about? I mean, yeah, of course, of course, everything changes in time. Then you're going to have a, like a new normal. They went, no, but you don't understand. It's going to be a new normal normal. And I said to him, listen, I said, I'm not bothered. I said, we've always got to be ready for a change or something like that. Because look, Crispin, you remember 
uh, last May bank holiday last year. Like, great fun. But I remember coming home after a show, 2 a.m. in the morning. There was people, drunk people, trying to punch buses in the street. Right? What is the new normal? The new normal right, is that people, uh, we're, we're all being polite to each other. We're looking out for all people trying to buy them food and people aren't eating bats. And these are the main things. I think this is, this is the new normal now. That people <laughs> are normal food and not trying to catch bats and put them in sandwiches. Um, and I think that's it really. There's, I mean, a, oh, one really quick thing, one really quick thing. And this was lovely. And because I always try and see what's really positive in the news. And did you hear about this, Crispin, about that lovely couple, a young couple from Manchester, and they were meant to get married this week in May, but obviously they couldn't, so they got married at home. Did you hear about that? Yeah, and yeah, I think I saw a picture of it, yeah. Yeah, and it was brilliant, it was all, over the, all over the press, and it was fantastic. And I thought this is the right way to do it. They were a young couple, they're in their 20s, and uh, they got married in their flat, and what they did was they made a priest... Um, they made their own priest out of empty bottles, beer bottles, with a big quilt around it. And then what they did was they did all their guests came on Zoom. And I thought that's fantastic because it's a young couple. You know what it's like, right? For these young people, now I feel sorry for them. We were lucky when we were younger, but these kids, they're saving money on catering, right? They're saving money on uh, the venue hire. They do it in their flat. And also, you know what it's like when you've got all your friends and family around and stuff like that at a wedding. People go on and on. But on Zoom, it's brilliant because you can just mute them. You can pretend your broadband's gone. You can just start deleting <laughs> off, your, off your wedding list. It'll be fantastic. And then they've actually got the wedding cake to keep for themselves. So I think I think that was a really positive story this week. And I think I think it is going to be. There will be some good changes coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I think we'll be all right. Well, that, that's really good. You've got always positive. Uh, and thank you for reminding me. It's a bank holiday. It is a bank. Uh, I, know, I only know that. Yeah. I only, I literally found out about thirty minutes ago. Well, actually, about an hour ago before the show started. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Patrick. And Hello. Susie. Hello. Hey. How are you doing? Hey. Do I look any different? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've no. done your... You've done no, your... I, well. I started my diet two days ago. Woo! Oh! Yeah! yeah. It only took 60 days, 19 stay-at-home for labourers, and I finally did it. And you know, sometimes there's like a catalyst. There's a moment where you think, right, I've got to sort it out. I, you know, I went for a swim the other day. Um, <laughs> my mum videoed me, and I looked like a dough ball in a flowery hat. And I thought, this is it. And it's basically the fear of outside land clothes. So I started my diet, and I don't feel funny today. So I think I've realised that carbs are the source of my powers because I just <laughs> got nothing in my head. But um, I was enjoying Patrick talking about. Um, the outside world is that you know I watched daytime telly there was a, a an item on this morning the other day and there was a an hairdresser who refuses to to not see her clients and she's seeing clients but they were interviewed this client and a hairdresser and they were back to the camera they had their backs to the camera because they didn't want to be identified and I thought it was hilarious they're just sort of sitting there and they put on a funny voice you know when they and I thought they just need to remember when they they do things where people don't wish to be identified it's normally like I do not wish to be identified <laughs> <laughs> but um, guess it's a Colombo cushion, guys. Oh, wow. It's a, a Colombo. I found this the other day. I was so pleased because I, I needed a mask to go into Asda's. And you know, I was talking about I'm getting a bit jowly. I just put Colombo on like this. And then Jean, you know, I'll talk about Jean. She she didn't appreciate it. So she's made me a show busy mask. Look at that. Oh, wow. Oh, it's sparkly with stars in it. And that's really cool because I realised that when you go to the shop and you always bump into people you don't want to see, they don't know who you are now and you don't have to wax your top lip or put your teeth in or anything. You can just... <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I, gen I genuinely started the diet two days. Oh, uh, where's Jean? Um, people want to see Jean, but I did ask her to come, but she, she says she wants to remain an enig enigma. So, um, and I said, people will think I've made you up like Norman Bates. They'll think I'm like imagining that I live with Jean. <laughs> <laughs> She's not here. But yeah, she's a proper legend. Um, uh, yeah, but I, I've been going out for walks more now and I'm I'm livid because Barney's sheet's still on the bridge and another one's appeared now. Um, happy birthday, Emma. So I, I don't know how long that's going to be up, but <laughs> I'm livid. I can't cope with it. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, I went for a proper long walk and my Fitbit was so in shock. It came up with a little message saying, are you OK, hon? Because it couldn't believe <laughs> it. But I've, honestly, I've reached that point now and I'm, on, I'm properly in the zone because the other night um, I had a, a very righteous dinner. And then Jean sat and had a big bowl of ice cream with wafers in it. And do you know what I had? I had a Yorkshire tea biscuit brew instead. 
I don't know if you know about this phenomenon, but it's biscuit flavored tea. So there's no extra calories and it's psychosomatic. When you smell it, it smells like biscuits and you feel like you're having tea and biscuits. So you, wow. without the calories, how brilliant is that? I know that's a bit of product placement, but um, it is really nice. It's, it's nice if you dip a Kit Kat in it. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been uh, <laughs> I've been trying to feel more empowered because I realised I've been sitting around doing nothing. So I've been I've been you know I watch a lot of telly and films. I've been trying to watch more films with a strong female lead to make me feel empowered, like Terminator Two and Misery, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but um, what else has been going on? Nothing's really been going on. I've just been like thinking about food. Um, I, 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 I am thinking about food quite a lot. In fact, I've got this uh, vanilla body butter and give it a couple more days, I'll be sticking a flake in it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I feel really good. I've, I've, been, uh, I've, been, I've been in the zone. I feel quite righteous. I went to Asda when it opened. So you know what happens when Asda opens? There's freshly baked tiger bread products everywhere. And I walked past it and I did not have any tiger bread products. Obviously I did get some gin, but you know, small baby steps, obviously I can't, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and it was fruity gin. So it is part of my five a day. So that's what's gonna happen. Um, but I have been uh, throwing myself into literature. I've been trying to distract myself from food by uh, literature. <laughs> uh, looking forward to reading, I fell in love with another man at my hen do. That'll be inspiring, strong female lead um but uh yeah I, i'm inspired by crispin's hat as well um i'm i'm not i'm not impressed with the constant talk of crumpets though it's making me salivate frankly well i could do um, without anyone eating crumpets. i love a crumpet yeah have you ever put bacon inside two crumpets like a bacon sandwich no no that's why your bmi is healthy crispy <laughs> <you've never done laughs> um <laughs> clotted cream on everything um, anyway, that was the old Susie. New Susie doesn't do that. But, um, my, my auntie gave me this present. Your, your hat's lovely, but my auntie gave me this hat. And look, it's got a massive wide brim. So it's really good when I'm sat in the garden reading my book. And also it's like a social distance hat because no one can get anywhere near me. Um, so I'm going to wear that and my mask in Asda's and not see any of my old school pals that I pretend to be friends with on Facebook, but never talk to in real life. When I see them in Asda, I go the other way, which is awkward <laughs> now. Well, a one-way system now. So I have to kind of like duck down and uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's it really, nothing's really happened. I'll, I'll see you <laughs> Wednesday. Hopefully I'll look significantly thinner on Wednesday. Um, We're looking forward to seeing, seeing Doing all right so far. Um, sorry? <laughs> I said it's going right. I've got, seriously, honestly, I, th I think carbs are the, the source of my powers because I, I just don't feel funny anymore. So I can't lose too much weight because it won't be funny anymore. You're, you are funny, you are funny. So oh, you thanks. can't help it. And if you lose too much weight, you look really old um because you, your face kind of goes like that so you've got to kind of take a bit of chubbiness because i remember that happened to pat butcher in eastenders years ago so lost loads of weight and uh yeah <laughs> so, gotta keep a little bit of chub just for the you know the the, the cheeks yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear anyway i must columbo's on so i've got to you know thank, thank you susie Thank you. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to say uh, the, the three comedians, we were going to be joined by Jason uh, today, but he's, he's he, he needs some money enough that he's gone out doing oh. deliveries uh, uh, for the bank holiday. So um, he's a driver, so he does he's doing some deliveries. So we haven't got Jason today, but we've had great um, work again from Susie, Patrick and Don. And uh, it'd be good if, if you could donate towards this gig, uh, so we can give uh, more money to them uh, as they're not getting any live work. Um, thank you, the comedians. Now we're going to move on to, um, I know it's it's Patrick's highlight, it's the Clash of the CLPs. Um, and the Clash of the CLPs uh, today, we have um, the mighty Cluid South against North Norfolk two rural constituencies, opposite sides of the country. Um, and uh, we're gonna, firstly, for, we're gonna listen to North Norfolk. We're gonna find out about North Norfolk. We're gonna listen to um, Mike Ward. Are you there, Mike? I am indeed. Um, Mike, I believe you're a poet from North Norfolk. Uh, yes. And you, and that you, are you, have you always been in Norfolk all your life? All my life, yeah. And this, this is a particularly Norfolk type poem. It is in it's in Norfolk dialect, yeah. Is it in Norfolk dialect? Okay. Uh, well, off you go, Mike. Okay. It's a, it's about a mouse. Well, blast your eyes, you dozy mouse. What a place to build your house. 
right where my old horse and plough look at fur on your brow. I see all right that you're frit and had enough of my old squit. But damn, that don't half give me pain to see your hum go down the drain. Instead of in your cosy home, you lay there flat neath the moon. You planned ahead to be all right, safe for day and warm at night. But now you squirm and fluzz in bed. I'll tell you now what's often said. The best laid plans of mice and man sooner or later go down the pan. Ah, well done. So are you, have you been a, a Labour member um, for a while or are you are you new to the party? I've been on, on and off. Uh, when, when, did you, in... when did you first join? Oh, God. <laughs> I should say about uh, in the 70s. And, and, you've, and you've come back in and you're and you're do you perform for well, the party? I went, I went out with uh, Blair de Farkle, of course, and uh, Okay, but well, we going to CP, then got fed up with that. He was, and I joined the CP after after Blair. You joined and, another party. Uh, We're not allowed to talk about that here. Oh, uh, really? About that here. I might have to mute you now. <laughs> I'm going to mute you. Well, um, we don't, we're I've not been in the Labour Party for a little while now, anyway. Well, it, thank you, thank you, um, Mike. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on now before you talk about other parties. Uh, I'm going to move on to Mandy. Hi, Kristen. Hello. Regular of the show. And this is your constituency, Mandy. It is. North Norfolk. It and is. How long have you been in North Norfolk? Well, I've been in North Norfolk since the 70s, um, but only a member of the Labour Party since 2015. Right, OK, so we're not going to go into other parties, uh, promise, please. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, now, uh, you've you're doing a lot of stuff in in North Norfolk, aren't you? For for members, uh, what what sort of what do you, what have you been doing? Yeah, well, I'm during, I'm the, during the lockdown. I mean, I'm kind of communications officer. So what I'm trying to do is keep the website very lively, keep our social media profile going, and we've been trying to contact um, uh, members over seventy. We've had a ring round. The EC um, decided, had a Zoom call, and we decided to um, ring everybody over 70 to check out that they were okay. Um, and on the website, we have a list of um, volunteer groups, many of which are run by uh, North Norfolk, Norfolk Labour Party members. And so we're trying to put people in touch with names and phone numbers if they need help. Uh, and trying to keep, just trying to keep our presence out there. We're very much hoping that the Labour Party can agree to some Zoom call meetings not perhaps every meeting but the facility for in a constituency like ours which is so large some members have to do a 40 mile round trip to come to a meeting so we're losing out on a lot of people who can't afford babysitters or just have difficulty getting out at night don't want to drive at night for instance um, and so we're really hoping that this post lockdown Zoom culture could help rural constituencies like ours, which have real difficulties getting people in for meetings. So we're a big uh, party, we've got over 600 members, but in meetings we probably only have 20, 30 people. Well, so we're really hoping that Zoom that, might really that, do yeah. something else. I mean that Zoom could actually be the key to making it more accessible for, for members, but the party do have to kind of give that instruction that they're valid meetings. So maybe we should do a campaign for, especially for rural constituencies, that they do Good that. Idea. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to move on because we're, we're, we're running a bit late, but, I did, but thank you, Mandy. We'll be back with you later. Um, Emma, are you there? Hi, I am, hi. You, you were the, the candidate for North Norfolk in the last general election, for Labour. Yeah, I was a part, parliamentary candidate i'm also a, Nor um, a norfolk county councillor oh, oh great and um what's what's your view on on a seat like uh, north norfolk as, as uh, mandy was saying all the members are so spread out do you think that it would be good to have a uh, sort of zoom post lockdown that every meeting in north norfolk could be zoom yeah, definitely. And, and remote voting. I mean, I, I think at conference a couple of years ago, I thought that a motion was passed that we were meant to be able to trial 
um, different routes because, you know, prior to this, there's loads of people that are excluded from meetings um, for a variety of reasons. And it just it, it shouldn't be beyond the wit of the party to make proceedings a lot more um, transparent and so that people can um, can participate and and vote. It's so archaic that, you, that, that the only way you get a say if you can physically turn up um, at a meeting. I mean, so I didn't mean to interrupt, but it, it also in the rural constituencies like North North Norfolk, it's difficult for Labour to get a foothold in in those areas unless they do change the way they do things, because obviously the Conservatives are seen as as stronger in rural communities, but there's lots of people struggling, aren't there, um, to get by. Uh, but we don't really we don't really hear about that because it's not an urban yeah. thing. Maybe it's got such an urban image. It has, but there's, um, it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. If you're forever told something's unwinnable and you have to go and target elsewhere, yes, absolutely, in a short campaign, but the rest of the time between elections, we should be building, and you do that by what Labour members do best. They're normally connected and involved in things with their communities, getting building those relationships with... Oh. When, when you go and talk to them, something political you've already established that relationship um with them so they're more willing to listen to a labor message that they might not have done before so you can't just pitch up every four years and knock on someone's door and go well, are you going to vote labor you've got to have a track record and so i'm hoping by still working with the clp and the county council are oh, you seen you seen some news um, if we can target a couple of seats then hopefully we can build from there well um um, thank you very much for joining the show, Emma. And uh, are you going to stand in the next election? Are you, are you, are you up for North Norfolk again? It'll, that'll be up to the members to decide who they want to select. I wasn't trying to trick you into, into, into saying anything <laughs> too presumptuous, but um, nice to speak to you. Thank you for coming on. Yes. Uh, we're now going to move to um, Cluid South, and we have um, a poet in Cluid South, Beth. Hi. No, you definitely don't have a poet in me, um, but I, I have chosen to share with you today some work by the celebrated Welsh poet. So it's not me. It's not you your may, poem. It's not my poem, if that's OK. Well, are you going to are you going to recite it in a really energetic way that's going to win us all over? Um, well, I'm try I will try my best. Okay. Um, oh. Well, it's been said before that um, even a shopping list could sound poetic in Welsh, so hopefully. Um, if I give you a brief history, um, very brief, don't worry, um, <laughs> it's written by T. Nicholas, and he was a good friend of Kia Hardy, and um, some of you may know he was his um, election agent in the 1910 election um, in Merthyr. Okay. Uh, like Kia, he was a Christian socialist and a committed pa uh, pacifist. Um, and he himself stood for Kia's seat after he passed. Um, but the media derided him and tore him to pieces, basically, for his um, anti-establishment, anti-capitalist views and so forth. So um, he went on to become a minister and used this platform um, to pre preach his message of uh, peace and unity. Um, but he was arrested, no charges, no evidence, no nothing, um, just simply for preaching um, his message of peace. Um, so this leads on to the poem I'm going to read. Um, it was one of 150 sonnets he wrote while in prison. Um, he was there for four months and he, he actually wrote um, all the poems on sheets of toilet roll and he chose sonnet because he worked out he could just about manage to fit 14 lines onto that sheet of paper. Okay. So, um, I'm going to copy now, I found two poems that I found that have been translated but the one I'm going to read is in Welsh. Um, so as we heard um, Mike's dialect there we're going to hear a bit of Welsh as uh, you've come up here. So hopefully this will work in chat. Okay. Cymerodd Hitler afael ar fy mamlad a phrydain afael yn fy llong eich rhyw. Ac ar fy ysgwydd dod i'r llaw hedd gadwaid 
am cae mewn cell yn unig tlawd a briw. Cymerwyd oedd i arnaf fi fy enw, bellaf nid ydw i fi ddim ond rhif, heb du, heb ffrind, heb un peth ar felw, fel darn o bren yn cofnofio ar y llif. Neb y yma'n dewall gair o iaith yn hadau, na neb yn poeni am byn hynged flin, cynhedloedd gwallgodd yn rhychuneb cadau. Blodau brawdoliaeth yn sarn a chi. Aeth pwyd am bopeth o'n fenaid. Do, ddim dar hwstwn nhw i wedi wareiddio dro. So, wow. we've got some translation there of, of, of a couple of other poems, but, but I thought as, as you're joining us in Clwyd South, that's, that's a bit of Welsh, right? Well, it's, great, it's great that you could share that with us and to show the Labour um, people in, in Wales are, uh, are culturally there doing stuff and, and 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 thank you for your introduction about the what was the name of the poet again uh t nicholas t nicholas well, well everyone can look him up look um, him. yeah he was a friend yeah, in a labor heroes quiz later on but not to, not today obviously because that would be giving it away thank thank you very much beth okay um i'm now going to move on to adam who's a member in cooid south are you there adam I am, yeah. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Um, so, yeah. so Clwyd South was a Labour seat until um, 2019. Mm, yeah, devastating. Um, what happened? What, why do you think it was lost? Was it was it Brexit? It wasn't through was it, it wasn't through lack of hard work. The, the 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 amount of people we had out on the ground this time um, was, I think, I'm right in saying, certainly for the last certainly for the last few elections, by far the most amount of people we'd had out. The problem we had here um, was uh, that this is a Leave constituency. Um, Wrexham, which is close by, is a Leave constituency. Both went to the Tories, as, as a number in North Wales did, for basically the same reason, um, uh, which was uh, Brexit as the main main uh, reason. Uh, tremendously worked tremendously well on the, on the ground uh, with the with the um, local uh, MP. Uh, candidate who'd been an MP for a while, she so wasn't necessarily on, shall we say, our side of the party, but that didn't matter. We worked very well together in the last campaign, um, and she was openly saying how fantastic the the CLP had been in supporting her this time and everything. And and um, we kind of got the impression it was something out of our hands on this occasion, that uh, something we couldn't control uh, as much as we tried. Uh, it didn't work out. I, I think that was more to do with factors that weren't local uh more to do with well almost certainly to do with brexit and and that being the main the main issue around here right so do, do you feel um possibly there's an optimism of any kind that you can win this back next time yeah yeah uh, in certainly in a lot of the clps in north wales um uh the vote was a borrowed vote and all from speaking and on the doors of to johnson because of brexit so I am convinced, yes, absolutely. And right across the Northwest, as we campaigned some of us in uh, various different CLPs, the same story all the time. There's been a gradual issue with trust with Labour that's been going down and down. That came back up. Um, a personal opinion, not speaking about for the CLP, I think the problem we had this time is, even if people believed the media and didn't like Corbyn on the doorstep, uh, which was the same in 2017, of course, then they at least saw him as being anti-establishment against the big boys if you like this time um i'm a remainer myself but this time thanks in part to the membership which is entitled to our view of course but we moved him into being ridiculously seen as being establishment versus ridiculously boris johnson being anti-establishment and uh th that absolutely hit us they lost trust in him because he was perceived as stopping brexit even though obviously that wasn't the case but that was the perception so can, uh, I, can I just can I just interrupt you because I'm a bit aware of the time, but I did just yeah. I mean I was informed yesterday that Boris Johnson actually stood yeah in Clwyd South in 1997 and yeah um, well, we sent him packing then yeah but it was uh, uh, unfortunately he's come back uh, to haunt us. <laughs> well, I bet we probably send him packing again um, in the yeah. next. But election. I have to say, just before we go, there's the CLP itself. I'm, I'm immensely proud to be part of it's. Uh, phenomenally what we've had successful campaigns and you remember in wales there's a lot of stuff that's devolved and we have a welsh labor government um uh, the new leader uh mark uh, a proper socialist he's a good guy 
and things get achieved in Wales and pushed on. We've even just managed to get things overturned within our own government through campaigning. So I'm incredibly proud of our local CLP, both the existing long-term members and the new Corbyn, I want to a better expression. We work very well together in, in making some serious overturns. We got the biggest defeat for the Welsh Labour at their own conference. Uh, we overturned decisions. We turned the unions on our side when they were with the government previously. So locally, to speak well of my colleagues, uh, I'm very proud to be part of the CLP because it's uh, it's incredibly well run. Um, and credit to Jackie and Vic, our secretary and chair um, there. Everyone else. Right. I'm going. I'm going to have a word with uh, where is she, Helen? Just a quick word of Helen. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Helen. Right. Um, so how? How are you? You've been getting a lot of plaudits there for for the work of the CLP. So you're keeping morale up, um, even though you lost in in the general election. We're trying our best at the moment. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, it hurt a, a bit at the time. I think it did for everyone. But you know, we we're all trying to focus on the future and trying to make sure that we get rid of Johnson and and the Tories because they're killing us. They're killing everyone. Yeah, literally. And you're se the secretary of the party. She's a nurse. You, 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 so she. Yes, Jackie. Yeah, she's a nurse. Um, she's working today. All right. So, so there's a lot of people actually on the front line with with the COVID as well. Um, yeah, I mean, um, we were going to have someone else have a, a chat with you. He's um, a retired pharmacist, but he's having to work today as well in one of the the hospitals to help cover there as well. So we've got a lot of people out working and, and doing things and contributing on the front line. Oh, well, thank you very much for being part of organising all this for Clue It's Up. It's good to hear from your members. And um, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to get down to the to the business of um, the actual uh, the actual big matter at hand, which is the um, Labour Heroes quiz. And um, representing uh, Representing um, Norfolk, we have uh, Martin. Um, are you there, Martin? Yes, yes, Chris Bean. Hello. Right, yeah, good. I like your banner behind you, just so we know. I know which one of which one of them that you are. Um, and then we have representing Cluid. We have Anthony. Are you there, Anthony? Yeah, I'm here. Hope you can hear me. I can. Yeah, you're a bit fuzzy. I don't mean your beard. I mean the actual picture. Uh, that, that I'm afraid that's uh, that's about that. That's one of the downsides of rural life. Uh, my broadband connection isn't the best. Well, hopefully, we'll I'll be able to hear you when I ask the questions. Oh no, it looks a bit better now. Sometimes it looks good and then it goes off again. Uh, but anyway, uh, are you ready for the toughest quiz of your lives? Uh, no, no. <laughs> no. I, I, I'm only doing this because I'm not a poet and I haven't been a member of the constituency long enough, so I can't talk about that either. So I'm, I'm, I'm in it by default, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for um, lowering our expectations. Uh, right. So the first, the first question is: um, Can you name who this is? Um, and it's a picture of. It's the first of you to answer. Okay. Can you name who it is? Angela Rayner. Angela Rayner. So who, right, that's, who said that? Martin? Yes. All right, okay. I'm going to have to mute Helen because she told everyone uh, by mistake. It's all right. Um, so Martin, you get... You say get thank you to Helen for that. That was excellent. You get one point for that, Martin. Right, next question. Um, who is... Now this is a... This is a, a, a picture from the past, so let's see if you can get this one. An old black and white. Who's this? Anyone got it? Um, no? Anthony? Are you there, Anthony? Oh, he's frozen. 
I think, Helen, you're going to have to take over because, are you there, Anthony? Can't see it. You can't see it. I'll put it on. I, I'm here, but I can't see anything on the screen. Oh, that's I saw not the last one. one. I you answered did. as well. But I think... oh, what did you say? Oh, no, I was on, I was, I was, I was behind. I was, I was... <laughs> oh, is that Betty Braddock? Betty Braddock. Oh, that's really deep. <laughs> Yes, it, it is Betsy Braddock. Was that you, Anthony? Yeah. Wow. I think, Helen, you're going to have to take over from this because um, because Anthony's the signal is not... Good I enough. really tried to avoid this. Helen, you, you've got to take over because it, it won't right. work. Um, so the next so do one... Do I get the Angela Rayner point then? Oh, you want the Angela Rayner? I think that's fair, Martin. Oh. So, so we'll have one point for Angela Rayner and one point, uh, Martin. You got Bess Did you get Bessie Braddock? No. No. All right. You didn't get anything. All right. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Let's let's move on quickly. Um, the next question is: Who is this when they were very young? Jeremy Corbyn. Helen's got it. Helen's got another one. Right. Um, so uh, don't give up. Don't give up, Martin, because um, we've got a couple of questions that are specifically about your constituencies. Um, and you. Sh this is a name. This is a councillor in one of your constituencies. Can you name who the councillor is? Martin? No, I can't name that person. Do you recognise them? No, sorry. Right. Okay. That was um, Jeremy Punchard, who's an independent councillor in North Norfolk. So uh, let's see if... Um, let's see how, how you do with your local councillor, Helen. Do you know who that is? Can't see it yet. Oh. I've got the circle of death. Have you got it now? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I'm just waiting for it to. Oh. Um, is it Pritchard? No. 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 Okay. Don't uh, know. You don't know who it is? Um, no. It's Melvin. Mills. Never heard of him. Oh, this is great. You don't know the. Did you know that, Adam? No. All right. Okay. Uh, so it's 2 0 to Helen. And now we're going to do the last picture question. And this is. Uh, this is a, a, a labour history, generally, a uh, labour history one. Who's this? Circle of Death, there you go. Oh. Mm. Um, yes, I don't think I know that one. 1960s? I wasn't born then. Good answer. Um. <laughs> um. It, it looks familiar, but I don't know. Right, let's see. Is anyone oh, got it in the chat? Then, but have you got a clue, Is it Dennis Healy? No. No. Nope. Is it Dennis Healy? Is it Dennis Healy? No. 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 No one in the chat? Do you want me to try again? You're going to give a clue? Um, he was very controversial. I wouldn't say he, he behaved impeccably in his life. He was known to do some pretty... Uh, He's also rumoured to be a spy, uh, so that's not... So there's a lot of chat on there that's saying some answers, so I'm not going to answer because one of them's just oh, okay. said that. So someone might have it. Uh, let's see who's got it in the chat. Uh, Nina. Where's Nina? Might have to talk to Nina. Nina? Um... 
ನೀನ ನೀನ ಇದೆ Uh, Nina hasn't got a mic apparently. Oh, that's not very good. Well, anyway, it was Tom Dryberg. Uh, he was uh, uh, in the. He was a Labour MP in the sixties. He was. He was just rumoured to be a spy. Um, there were lots of other stories about him. Now, at the moment, um, Cluid South are winning, um, but this is your chance to come back in, uh, Martin, because we've got the singing round. Um, Are you uh, able to perform a song for us that you would sing normally in the shower? Uh, uh, yes, I've got to, I need a suggestion as the song and then I'll sing it. Well, I don't, I'm not often around your shower, um, but I would, I'm looking at you, I would think, are you sort of into punk or something? Um, I, I feel as though I should say yes, because my wife was, was a punk in her day, but, um, uh, do you want to sing, um, uh, what do I get by the Buzzcocks? What do I get? Oh, what do I get? And do you want to try another, just do one more, um, one more of the chorus because it, it repeats itself a bit and you, we haven't really got the flavor of your performance in just that bit what do i get oh what do, we've seen we've seen the buzzcocks live in norwich a number of times okay just want a lover like anybody else what do i get oh okay well that's that's a good start um martin now helen yes it's your turn Um, do you have, You're not going to thank me. I will thank. I will thank. Do you have a particular song that you like to sing in the shower or bath? I don't know if you have a bath, maybe. Um, yeah, but I can't think of any at the moment, so I'm just going to go for something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's going to be Billy Bragg. Okay. Okay. I was 21 years when I wrote this song. I'm 22 now, but I won't be for long. People ask me when will you grow up to be a man when all the girls I love to school are already pushing prams. There you go, very out of key. Uh, right, okay, so you sang a, 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 a. Are you getting applause? Are you getting applause? <laughs> okay, so here we go. Here is the quiz. The, the, the last question is a poll. Um, who won the singing round? So please submit your um, answers. And we'll find out shortly um, when we get over the 50% who's got there. Um, okay. It's looking good for Cluid South at the moment. Um, yes, Cluid South uh, have actually won. Um, wow. I will. Uh, I will share the results with you. Uh, that's the that's the end of that round. So, actually, Clue and South have have pretty much. Uh, it's a it's you've whipped North Norfolk in this competition. Sorry. Um, but um, thank you, thank you, Martin, for um, for being a game contender. Thank you, Crispin. And. Uh, And uh, I appreciate you all coming on. And I, 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 we learned quite a bit about different constituencies. Um, and we had some Welsh, which was fantastic. Thank you, Beth. And it's good to see Adam again. I, I saw Adam, I think, in Liverpool. Or was it, was it, it was Manchester, wasn't it? We did a show up there for um, JC for PM tour. Uh, so, uh, Cluid South are now in the quarterfinals. Uh, and they will play whoever uh, wins the next uh heat but now at the end of the show we've come to the we've come towards the end of the show and this is where we we speak to our resident singer songwriter <laughs> rob are you there rob i am here yes yes uh thank you for staying with us uh Always I, I, enjoyable. Said we, i said we'd do an hour show today um i've just missed it by half an hour it's not that bad it, it's 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 shorter than a football match 
It's shorter than a football match. It kicks off at three. Um, so Better quality pies as well, probably. Well, I was just thinking actually about you. Is that you, obviously as a Brentford supporter, you must be quite upset that you've not actually been able to say goodbye to your <laughs> your ground. Um, no last no last trip to Griffin Park. Really sad. It's like, yeah, it's a bit sad. Extra yeah. special match, I think. Anyway, let's not get too sad because we've got to, we've got to play your your song yes. again. You've written a you've written a song um, based on what was said in last show about the red wall. And what's the name of the song again? Uh, it's called Blue Light on a Red Wall. Blue Light on a Red Wall. So I'm going to um, I'm going to play your song if I can find it. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, Moonlight paints a shadow on a crumbling red brick wall. The ambulance a good ten years to wait. What did you expect the rain to do except to fall? What did you expect she'd do but wait? For you to tell her, there, there, it's all right. You'll get lucky, come and let you know. They promise you Beyonce now, George Ford is dead and gone. The compensation never did come through. We're knocking back Prosecco with asbestos in our lungs. What did you expect? She'd wait for you. Well, I told you not to phone me here, all right. You'll get lucky come election night. Blue light on a red brick wall. Blue light on a red brick wall. Smart boy in a clever suit, his pockets full of fist. He knows which way the wind blows, who cares why? He knows all her body's bruises, which three words will do the trick. He offers her a thin blue alibi, and he'll teach that bitch what grateful means. All right, oh, he'll get lucky, come election night, blue light on a red brick wall, blue light. On a red brick wall, the ambulance to ten years to wait.
<laughs> very, very moody. That song. I've, I've, I've gone off into it. Uh, I'm, I'm all over the place. My, my emotions have changed now. I, <laughs> I was, I was quite highly strung, and now I feel really relaxed. And <laughs> have you, um, have, have, do you think you this lockdown's made you chill out a bit? I think it's given me an opportunity to do more songwriting. And so, um, yeah, uh, I'm exploring other, other other areas of songwriting, yeah. No, it's, it, 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 it wasn't like the normal style. You, you're not doing much on the strumming there. It's very, very oh. uh, minimal. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and it was fantastic. York, Yorkshire fantastic Noir. That you're coming up with these new, new ways of doing it. So, um, what can we get for next week? Oh, uh, how about we just do Jeremy Corbyn's birthday party with the? Oh well, I haven't mentioned that yet. You've just, you've just, you've just uh, <laughs> said something that we that we hadn't. Um, I'll I'll see what I can do um, with that because I can see you. Ha I can see him happy birthday, couldn't I? And hope he's watching. Um, yeah, because what I wanted to say to everyone here was that we've actually got a special show next week. Um, with Jeremy Corbyn's birthday party, which is on Wednesday. Um, and I am going to send an invite out to everyone here to come to Be Jeremy Corbyn's birthday party. Uh, and Jeremy Corbyn will be there. And we will have music, comedy, lots of speeches from different people who have worked with him and admired him. And I'm also going to ask people here to send in their own videos if they'd like to as a, to, to give a tribute to Jeremy Corbyn and to wish him a happy birthday because I don't think any Labour leader has had to put up with the stuff he's had to put up with and I think he has done amazingly well to keep going for all that time and I think it would be a really good gesture if we had so many people sending in messages and I could just go through them one after the other and um, maybe he'll his spirits will be raised and i'm sure our spirits will be raised just by seeing that we all were there for him so um i will send an email after this show and ask you if you'd like to contribute to that and also give you details uh, and if you'd like to um help with the contributions to the show that would be appreciated too so i am now going to unmute everyone uh which is what i didn't mean to do at the very beginning of the show <laughs> um that was a mistake uh this is all on purpose uh so are you ready to make as much noise as you can yeah and say goodbye and hello to everyone and i will leave you to do that for the next half a minute uh bye for now Hey everybody! Hey. 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 Uh, oh, 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 as we speak, peach, peach, I think. come in, peach, I I peach. Left to be from all bargains. Thank you, thank you, Madeline. Oh yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well,